anything confidential, so speak openly. This presentation comes out of both my work and a book project I'm working on, and it lands somewhere in the middle because this is the title of the session is Beat the Attention Economy with Expertise and Community. The subtitle is The Power of Deep Work Over Social Media Addiction. It's not a rejection of social, but it's a reframing. Welcome, I'm just now getting started. So oh, and we are we will be heavily interacting, so okay, I won't good. this is not a lecture series. All right. Um, but we were just chatting for a while. Now I'm going to share a little bit of the content for the session. So so it's not a rejection of social, but it's a rethink of, of social. My day job, which consumes most of my time, is I'm the co-founder of an independent technology publication called Diginomica. And we look at issues of digital and culture change, primarily in large organizations. And we're just about to cross our five-year anniversary, which is sort of cool, because we're a bootstrap startup, and we've done pretty well. In the media world, we you never know. It's a very difficult industry, but it's fun. In my extremely limited spare time, I'm working on a book that I've worked on for about five years, and it's a book for artists on navigating the digital economy. And so it's a book about creativity, but the more I wrote about the book, the more I realized that I needed to start at the beginning for people, which is that if you don't have a clear sense of identity and voice, then there's no point in talking about how to navigate the digital economy. If you don't have something to say, it's sort of game over. And and so I think that applies for for, for businesses as well. And so this, this talk kind of straddles the fence between personal and, and business identity, and you can pull it in either direction as we go, depending on what your, your, your interests are. In my last session, which I won't get into too much here, my last session was about how buying is changing and why sales and marketing therefore have to change. And, and in that session, in a nutshell, I talked about how buyers aren't someone we target anymore in isolation. Buyers are part of networks of people that they trust. What we're really doing is we need to target communities. And we don't want to target communities from the outside, but from the inside. So we want to pick our business or our creative projects should focus on communities that we have intimate knowledge of that we want to be a part of. And there are several ways to be a part of those communities, but I would argue that the best way, I, I included some not good ways like being a celebrity. Um, Can I, I think, for one sec? Yeah. Can you just go back? You made some comment. Buyers are... Oh, the, the buyers, the, the targeting buyers in isolation doesn't make a lot of sense anymore. Like classically, you would develop a persona of an individual and target that individual. But in the modern purchasing environment in most industries, it's much more of a collaborative process. The buyer is doing a lot of research on their own, so they might be searching for content. They're looking at peer reviews. They're talking to their peers. They're talking to influencers. So it makes a lot more sense to think about targeting communities where your buyers reside. They're much more informed than they used to be. Mm -hmm. uh, they're much more autonomous. Mm -hmm. uh, they're also much more distracted, which is the common problem. Buyers are part of networks they trust? Was that it? Yeah, that's it. That's they're part of networks that they trust, right. right. Yeah, thank you. Which are part of the larger community, I guess you could say. Yep. Buyers are also really distracted. Mm -hmm. The attention economy is vigorous. People have these devices in their pockets that ping them from all directions, from text messages to streaming videos to whatever it is you're trying to get across, yep. which is why in the last talk I did, I emphasized the importance of what I call opt-in communities, which are people who are opting into what you do. They're subscribers of various kinds. Mm -hmm. They're subscribing to your YouTube channel, but hopefully subscribing to things like email where they want to hear from you regularly because you're delivering something of value. So that obviously changes sales and marketing because it turns marketers into educators and it turns salespeople into advisors. Uh, not just, oh, I have the gift of gab, so I get someone on the phone. How you doing? Blah, blah, blah. No. Do you have data to show me about how I can run my business better? Mm -hmm. Do you have something that can help me today? Otherwise, get off the phone. So those professions are under a lot of duress and change as a result of all this. And most modern marketers are getting better analytics, but they're not getting better at storytelling or content for the most part in an authentic way. So one of the big themes of this particular session is that most folks don't know what they're doing on social media. They feel obligated to be on social media. They, they go to events like this because social media is so cool. And unfortunately, the attention economy brings out the desperation in how we participate on social because when people don't pay attention to us, we, we get desperate. My argument is to put all that desperation aside and to look at 
developing what I call topic authority, which is developing expertise in something important, figuring out how to create content around that, and then sharing that content with a community of people in a helpful way. And being an expert doesn't mean that you have to be, you know, have a PhD. It really means more that you're passionate about something, you put a lot of time into understanding that, and you figure out helpful ways of sharing that content that are sustainable for your personal or business, right? Because part of developing opt-in audiences is they expect more stuff from you over time. So you have to figure out how to do this in a way that is sustainable. Hopefully you choose an area where people need truthful information, not bullshit. And there are fortunately a lot of industries where people still need to do this. This centers around my particular viewpoint. I'm coming upon this theory that solitude is becoming a competitive advantage that the capacity for what I call deep work is is very important. There's someone, uh, one blogger in particular, who writes a lot about deep work by the name of Cal Newport. He's a professor, and he's written a couple books on this topic. I, I like his blogs better than his books. One of his books is called Be So Good They Can't Ignore You, which I love um, as a title. But the theory is basically this you got to choose your niche carefully because you're going to be living with it for a long time. When I was early in my business career, I thought you could dabble in marketplaces, but you can't. It's success in whatever, however you define that, takes longer than you think. So you got to choose your niche carefully. That's why the first phase is not jumping on social, but doing some identity work around yourself and your business, or perhaps both, and what it is that you believe is uniquely powerful about what you're doing. And of course, eventually as a business, you're going to want to tell a a story about that that resonates with people, but that's kind of another topic. The next phase is what I call a creative deep work cycle. I view it as reflection, research, curation, and creation. The curation part means that As you're researching, you're starting to become more transparent in how you research. You see stuff you like, that people wrote, you share it. You ping their names and say, hey, this piece by so-and-so is great. It changed my thinking on blah. You're starting to develop a, a network around that which you curate in your community. You may eventually use that as content as well. So you might eventually... Like, like for example, in my industry, I have a weekly roundup called Hits and Misses that looks at the highs and lows in my field, and it's based on a curation that I do on a daily basis of content that resonates with me, and that impacts my own creativity because in, in business, I think it can be very valuable to create in the context of what other people are talking about. Sometimes I call that advancing the conversation, but at any rate, once you have that sort of sustainable cycle of what I consider deep work. I might, in a business context, I might even include things like eBooks, um, which become webinars. Then you can start thinking about participating in social in an authentic way based on what it is that you have to share and the community you're involved with. And we had a very interesting conversation before we started here with Julia about the fact that social is not an obligatory thing and that in every community, there's different social networks that people participate in or not. If the community that you're targeting doesn't care about social, then there's really no reason for you to. (laughs) But in most communities, there's some social forum where people are participating. And then there's on-the-ground events in in many communities as well. And it makes a lot of sense to be going to those events also, hopefully presenting at some point on topics that you care about. But you start just by going as an attendee. And so that's sort of the, the cycle. There's a really, really good book by Seth Godin about this called We Are All Weird. You guys may have heard of Seth Godin before, but he's a so-called marketing guru and genius who's published all these bestsellers. We Are All Weird is a short book. You can read it in an hour. It's like more like a shorter ebook. But essentially his notion is the global internet allows us to have weird niches that allow us to compete in ways that large companies can't for certain audiences. And we can connect with people almost globally on our businesses. Now, there's some exceptions to that. If if you're a massage therapist, it can be a little difficult to globalize that. But I actually do know some local massage and healer people that do phone sessions now, for example, that are very powerful. So, so, or perhaps online classes and stuff like that. But the notion is that when Seth says we're all weird, he's saying that we can all be successful by connecting with people who share our interests on, on a much more globalized scale than ever before. I personally think he's a little optimistic about that topic, but it can be motivating to read his point of view. 
the phrase that I made up that, that I credit to him because he wrote the book, the book, my favorite phrase that I asked myself is your, I asked myself, is your success weird enough? Because we don't have a lot of time in this life and it makes a lot more sense for us to feel like our success emanates from something authentic, which to me, like I'm, I'm using weird in a complimentary way of like that I'm allowed to sort of fly my freak flag and that people find that that resonates with them and somehow commerce <laughs> takes place over that. So our content should reflect our weirdness or our unique capabilities. And that's really the, the theme of, of my talk. I mean, I, there's a lot of points because I'm writing a book about that, but that's sort of the very short version. So now I'll open it up to whatever comments or questions you guys might have. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The thing I struggle with is that, you know, I think about like the, sort of the global aspect of it. And for me, I'm so hyper local. Yeah. Right? Because I'm a, I'm a photographer. I need clients, you know, 45 right. minutes from me. Right. And, and and I and not only that, but then I specialize in pregnant women, but not just pregnant women, women who want intimacy and depth <laughs> yeah. in their photographs and want their partners to be brought with them. So it's yeah. like it's such a narrow little sliver that I love. Mm. And yet like being able to sort of like put myself out there and like what sort of I, you know, I just don't know what to Can I offer you some unsolicited business advice? Would that be okay? Of course. All right, what I would want, since you clearly have a passion for the topic, but local is an obvious parameter for you. While you would love to connect with people who care about this all over the world, there's an immediate need of connecting with people within a certain radius. So what I would want to see you do is to start with with blogging on your website around this topic, but in such a way where you frequently work into your blog posts local destinations. So in other words, when you're thinking about it from a search perspective, you're thinking about not people that are searching for pregnancy alternatives or whatever. They're doing that, but also in Northampton, Mass., or in Goshen, or in the Pioneer Valley. You want content that combines local landmarks with the topic. Because in search, that's going to be really, really important. And eventually, you want to be able to type into search things like that and see your content come up in search so that people are doing that. You will probably also have to spend some time looking at various local directories. You may have already done that because the only problem with hyperlocal is that some of it is getting dominated by, in the restaurant industry, it's Yelp, for example, or you know where, where certain hyperlocal sites are drawing a lot of search traffic. And so you may have to figure out how to also participate on those sites. But I think you could also do a lot of looking at things like local workshops, and partnering with other local organizations to put on workshops Mm -hmm. because the personal network around what you're doing is important. So you have a topic authority thing, but the global thing is going to be less useful to you. Well, yeah. And that's that's the thing. I sort of hear all the, like, oh, this is, you know, put this out to the world. I'm like, I don't need the world. I need. (laughs) Yeah. But but hyperlocal is still dependent on content, right? Because you can't do workshops and you can't get search engine traffic without content. Well, this is the thing. I want, I want women in Boston to travel to me. There's mm-hmm. no reason why they shouldn't. Right. And there's plenty of photographers in Boston, but mm-hmm. I'm, not, I'm not doing what they're doing. They should come to me. Right. <laughs> so I th- Northampton, and then you'll get Boston. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that's right, but I also think you'll have to go to Boston some yeah. to get them to come to you, if that makes any sense. Mm-hmm. So you'll, you'll need to get your feet on the ground in Boston and figure out how to put on some events there that welcome people in, mm-hmm. open house type things or whatever it is mm-hmm. to get people interacting with you. Once they meet you and form a relationship with you, I would guess they will travel for you. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. If what you're offering really is different enough from what the people in Boston are doing, who mm-hmm. would do something similar? Mm-hmm. But, you know, who are the duelists in Boston? Where's the... Annual Boston Doula Conference. Mm-hmm. That's where all the, tour, all the, the, the shopping in Boston, you know, from toy stores to clothing. All of those places offer events. Mm-hmm. So you go in and do an event. Uh, and if you get it down in Northampton, they'll be like, this is different photography than I've seen. I want that. I don't want the service equal shit. Right. Take your rattle. <laughs> so. Yeah. So, 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 one, just one more comment on that. You've accomplished some important things because 
you've done a lot of the identity work. You understand what's unique and valuable about what you do, which is really, really important. A lot of people don't have that. You also have expertise around your creative gifts. The the one thing I would really modify a little bit, though, is that unfortunately photography is not a great digital medium for discovery because of how people lift images and don't source images. So in addition to your photography, you're going to need to develop other content capabilities. You seem very well spoken and I imagine you could do really good workshop type sessions and stuff. You need something to drive that. So whether it's writing or slides or podcasts, you need some raw content vehicle to start generating the content that then becomes the basis for workshops and more searchable content, right? Because photography is not very searchable content. You need more searchable content. Does that make sense? Yeah. There's some, there's some other questions in my mind. Why don't you just think about that for a sec, okay. and let's hear yours, and then we'll get back to just you. Just a quick question. So for an industry like hers, what would be an example of searchable content for a photographer, for example? Like, I know what mine is. Well, so the, I show up, like, Western Mass Fraternity Photography. Like, uh-huh. you know. Right. <laughs> searchable content would be, for example, a photo essay of a successful process with a client of hers, right? So oh, like a white so, kind of so Well, I would say a blog, like a, a blog. very a very kind of social this is the story of this family. Oh. Here's what happened and working the oh, pictures yeah. into that. I mean the advantage she has is that I'm oh. sure she has some amazing stories. I mean we don't yeah. have time today probably to get into oh, a lot right. of those but but she's got a great storytelling angle that oh, she can oh, use. Yeah. And that becomes searchable, but she'll need to spend a little bit of time making sure once she's written something like that, that it has the proper keywords around, Mm -hmm. you know, I'd have to have a longer conversation with you to figure out what those keywords and key phrases would be. But the stories are there and the keywords can be worked into that. Once the short version of the SEO thing is that once that's written, that needs to get shared so that people start linking to it and mm-hmm. po- and cross posting it and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So SEO doesn't go up just because you put a new post up; it has to get shared. So, in other words, like there's very little unique space that no one's written about. And so search engines decide on the importance of your piece based on who is linking to that piece. So once you've written content, you want people to start linking to it and sharing it and search results increase as your so-called perceived authority goes up. So, so if somebody shares something on LinkedIn, does it go up or it has to um, be I would say that outside of I would, the platform? Google takes all links in, into account, but I, powerful links are from so-called authority sites, some of which are way out of our reach, like CNN and New York Times and stuff like that. But within even your industry. So for example, if there's websites that write about pregnancy alternatives and stuff, you want them to be linking back to your stuff. So a lot of it is figuring out the topic neighborhood you live in and finding the websites that are respected in those neighborhoods and hopefully they're linking. So the way you make the most of content is by getting people to link to it. But it also, content is is the basis for which you repurpose things into your story of what you have to offer. So in some cases, you might also have podcasts. In other cases, you might do short videos. I would think visual storytelling is going to be very important for you. So obviously pictures and maybe some video work is very important. For other people, it's webinars. For other people, it's online training courses. I mean, there's a lot of different formats that happen, but I think a lot of times the first step is outlining something that goes through what's unique about your thought process. And then you figure out how to purpose that and repurpose that content again and again. Because a lot of people what I run into is they say, well, I wrote this blog, but it only got a few hits, so I'm not going to do that again. And I'm like, well, if you wrote 20 blogs, that's an ebook, And now you can package that as an ebook, And that's a Kindle also, by the way. And, and maybe at that point, there's a media person who's going to want to interview you or maybe you approach them and say, hey, I can help you with this story. Or So viewing, viewing the performance of content in isolation is, is a classic social media mistake. And it's one reason why people get discouraged on social because they're like, well, I did this informative post on Facebook and my friend posted a baby picture and I got 100 likes and no one saw my post. Well, that's going to happen. Of course that's going to happen. But if you have a community that cares about your stuff, then you're constantly sort of resurfacing stuff and reconnecting so things don't die on the vine. What if you're... I'm 
maybe this is true for everyone in this room, but you you're in a business where you have to have confidentiality around who your clients are mm-hmm. and what they do. And so sometimes I want to, you know, trumpet the horns and can't really mm-hmm. because that exposes someone else. Sometimes you have to go a couple levels up in generalities. So sometimes you can do a piece like that where you write about several different people and but you anonymize a ton of stuff and you just do that. It is a disadvantage, obviously, because ideally, especially with a like a customer use case, it's ideal if you can name the customer and who they are. But in some cases, for a variety of reasons, that can't happen, in, uh, whether it's legal or personal. In that case, you have to take a couple steps back. In other cases, you can talk to the person and say, hey, I'm, I want to write about your story, but I'm going to sort of anonymize it. Can I show you a draft before I publish it to make sure you're okay with that going out? And that way you can maybe nudge a little bit closer if you need to, but still know that they're okay with it and make sure to get that in writing if it's you know sensitive. But yeah, you may have to pull back a little bit on some things for that reason. You gotta be careful. So. I, I really like this um, idea of the opt-in communities. Yeah. A very cool take on what you just shared. Sure. And I, what I'm wondering about is what kind of platforms do you, what are you thinking in terms of a platform to use for that? Like, I know there would be mm-hmm. like a membership site, you know, might mm-hmm. be, or it might just be whatever you're doing, a ton of YouTube videos and you've got a ton of followers. Like, how do you, how right. are you thinking about that? One of the biggest challenges is that, is that there's not, people are too spread out now to sort of have like one platform. And so we end up like divided between different tools, for example. Mm -hmm. So like in our site, we, we use MailChimp for our email. And so we have subscribers in there, but we also have YouTube channels that people subscribe to. And so there are some challenges sort of consolidating some of that and figuring out what's what, I mean, Ultimately, like if you have like a key piece of thing like a newsletter mm-hmm. you want people to subscribe to, then that can become the core of it. But as far as content is concerned, mm-hmm. my favorite thing is a content library that people have to sign up for. They generally won't do that for videos because videos are kind of like mostly public. They might do it for a training course, though. They would definitely do it for a series of ebooks, you know, or a series of white papers or whatever you want to call them. Mm-hmm. Now, sometimes what happens is that those get marketed individually. So people talk a lot about landing page design and how you have a so-called asset. So you're optimizing a landing page. So you'll sign up just for that asset, which is fine. And we're, we do some of that. But in the, ultimately, what you really want is for people to view your site as, a, as sort of a membership site, even if it's free, because that's how you really know what's going on When I talk about opt-in communities, the highest evolution of that is the logged-in user. And and that's why Facebook, obviously, is so powerful. And and obviously, they get themselves into trouble over this, too, as we all know now. But essentially, you're always logged in when you're participating. So they have an enormous amount of data on who you are and what you're doing and what you care about because you're always logged in. For a lot of our websites, we don't have that luxury because if we... If, if we put all of our content behind a login, then we're going to lose all of our search traffic. And so, you know, a, a marketing plan has to combine the proper combination of content. Think of it as free content for search and social sharing and then opt-in content or sign-up content or sometimes I call it free premium content that people are going to have to sign up to get access to. And ideally, that becomes a library where they kind of join and sign up for all the content you have there instead of just individual pieces. Do you mean somebody who's searching the Internet won't find those particular pieces? They won't. They might find the landing pages for them, but they won't find all of the in-depth content because it's probably, it might even be in like a PDF format or something. And the reason for that is that it's a value exchange and you have to figure out like, if I give you this much value, how much information will you share? And there should be an equilibrium there. If I have a hundred page something on something you care about that I spent two years on, I think it's reasonable to ask you for some information Mm -hmm. in exchange. Obviously you're not going to abuse that because, because that's not how you view it. You're trying to help people and make a difference in their lives. And so 
as they gain trust in you, they share more and more information with you. And, and that's valuable. Whether you ever charge for content is an open question. I think in most cases, you never charge for content, but there could be exceptions to that. I mean, like training courses are a really good example, but in most of our industries here at PodCamp, we have other services that are much more lucrative than selling a, a book for 10 bucks ever would be. So, so generally, we're balancing our content between totally free content and sign-up content where we obtain some data in exchange for mm-hmm. the content. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. and the mix of that is, is the trick. And then, and then, of course, there's a whole different way of framing this, which is around the buyer's journey. And, and that's looking at having content for every step in the in the so-called journey of your buyer, which marketers spend a lot of time on. So they, because obviously when you're first looking into something, you know, what are my options? That's very different than when I'm like, I really want to kick tires on this product. So now I want to see like how to videos and, and I really want to see some product information. So it's like a balance of branded and non-branded kinds of content. Ultimately to really build trust, you need to have some, the two kinds of content that that build the most trust are, are helpful content where you're, answering people's questions in an informative way or what I call thought leadership content, which is a much abused phrase, but that's where you're really looking at your industry and providing unique ideas and viewpoints that no one else has heard of. Mm -hmm. And you're sort of branding yourself as, as, as an expert. Mm -hmm. And and that's where the workshops and speaking engagements come in and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thank you. Those are kind of cliff's notes of much longer discussions, yeah, but yeah, it's really helpful. I mean, am I the only one who's exhausted by the amount of content? Like what? No. You know, thought leader content. Right. You know, there are billions of people saying the same thing in sure. slightly different ways. Yeah, it, there's always been a, an attention economy. It's just getting more and more noisy. I don't necessarily think that people have, some people are like, well, content has to be short because people have limited attention spans. I'm not sure about that. I just think that, that what happens is that, you know, that clearly people are willing to immerse themselves in, say, everything from Harry Potter to, to Game of Thrones. But I think they will also immerse themselves in highly relevant content, too. So, for example, if someone's looking for, a green card in the U.S., you, you can bet they're going to read the heck out of a long blog on the problems with that because it's highly relevant and important to a life situation. In our line of work, we probably aren't going to entertain people as much. It's great if we do, but we're trying to be highly relevant and solve their problems. Yes, attention span is more and more of a problem in terms of all the stuff you're competing with, but I think that's why the subscribable piece is so important because then you're repinging people. So even if they're not thinking about you today, you're pushing stuff out to them. Mm-hmm. It's a gentle form of interruption because they've said, I don't mind if you interrupt it because I respect you and you have stuff that I need. Yeah. What is the difference between... Okay, so you have... You stash blog posts on your site, and people could go back to June 2012. Um, I don't know what I'm actually asking. You know, just the way to divide up the information on a website. Mm. So you have this private library on the one hand for people who've opted in, mm-hmm. but you have other content for people who aren't opting in. Right. You could think of it as like a blog and a resource library. And the two things need to connect to each other nicely. How it is you do that depends on your site design. Like maybe you always have something on the top right for your resource library no matter what page you're on. Maybe you always have also like a recent blog comment or title on every page so people can go back and forth between the two. The thing about blogs is that most people won't go back in time over over a blog, usually they land on it through search or recommendation and they'll read that post, but they're not going to go back one after the other. They might click on a topic. So if your blog has like um, top, a few well-placed topics at the bottom, they might say, Oh, I want to see more on this topic and click on that topic link and then read other things on that topic. What I think of it a lot of times is like, we talk a lot in the industry about calls to action and how, you want to be thinking in terms of 
for those who are going to go further with you, making it easy for them to do that. So at the end of blog posts, you know, hey, we have this webinar coming up, or if you like this, you might want to check out the PDF. But you probably won't even just do it at the end of a blog post because not everyone makes it to the end. So times I'll be like, you know, as I wrote in last last week's piece on blah, blah, blah kind of link. Now, not everyone's going to click on the link, but what they're doing is they're getting an idea that this is a constant preoccupation of mine. It's not, this is not a one-off post. It's, it's part of an ongoing conversation we're trying to have. That does impact website design. But I think for the most part, the biggest thing about the website piece is having a content management system that you can update easily yourself without being dependent on the days of like sending content on a piecemeal basis for your web designer to post for you or over, you know, it's got to be easily updatable on your own. And, Mm -hmm. and from there you can continue to add stuff. So I, I mean, when I'm in person talking, I kill it. They're like, you know. See that's see that's why I think yeah, you should yeah. look at that and look at how it all feeds <laughs> together. Facebook ads and everything. It's like it's, it, it, I have to have that personal connection. So there's a problem. It feels like I struggle because I want things to get bigger, and yet I feel like for it to work for me, it has to be really intimate and personal. Mm-hmm. So, I think with the uniqueness and how well thought you are in this, I think I'd like to see a book at some point because and, and the blog post obviously can be the raw material mm-hmm. for that, mm-hmm. but. The thing about books, and, and if you if you run into Claudia Gear this afternoon, she consults on this, and you might just want to check in with her because she's got a lot of content on this, but books still have a lot of power in terms of in, enforcing your authority on a certain topic. It, it matters more than ever, I think, even if a ton of people don't read it. The fact that you have it yeah. makes a huge, huge difference in terms of how you're perceived, and that leads to all kinds of opportunities for you to speak and I, I just I see you in front of audiences like yeah um, maybe not huge necessarily but but, but definitely big enough you know you got it those are assets that you clearly have you got to use that yeah. but I think writing too I just think you got to pull combine all those things together anyway hopefully this was helpful and carry into the afternoon conversations mm, okay. don't be afraid awesome. to put on a session yeah, really Thank intelligent you. so great yeah cool Great. Happy to do it. It's fun.